Hiya folks, I'm Justin from D23, the official Disney fan club. We're so excited to welcome you to our special at-home edition of a Goofy Movie's 25th anniversary. To celebrate this milestone occasion, we've brought together 11 members of the cast and crew for a comprehensive symposium on the eternal relationship between fathers and sons in the medium of animation. Hey! I'm here, hello! First, let me welcome the incredible director of a Goofy Movie, Kevin Lima. Kevin, you went on to direct some hugely successful films like Tarzan and Enchanted, but a Goofy Movie was your directorial debut. How did you fall into that, and what did you learn from that experience? Oh, man, it was far from falling into anything, to be quite honest with you. It was a long, a long journey to get there. I had worked at um, Disney Feature Animation, and I was a animator on Oliver and Company, a character designer on Little Mermaid, and Beauty and the Beast, and I did storyboards on Aladdin. And I decided, I was getting sort of itchy, and I decided that I wanted to direct. So I went up to the, the top brass at the time and said, hey, I'd like to direct something. And unfortunately, there was no room at Disney for another director. So I left the studio to pursue that, uh, that dream. And within about, I'd say about nine months, I was doing a freelance job on a project at Disney Toon Studios called, I didn't really have a title at that point. I think it was just called The Goof Troop Feature. And the guy who was directing it decided that he was going to take another opportunity. So they asked me uh, to take it over. And that's where it all began. Next, the incomparable writer behind so many of your favorite Disney Afternoon series like Goof Troop and, of course, a goofy movie, Jim Magon. Hello, everyone. So nice to see you. And um, according to what's written under my uh, face, it says I'm a writer. So I'll go with that. <laughs> All right, Jim, tell us how you first got involved with this project and how it complemented a Disney Afternoon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um Goof Troop uh, was a show that I was story editing, and uh, we did 65 episodes of that. And then somewhere along the way, they decided they wanted to do, I think, a two-parter uh, to cut into an hour-long film. That got dropped, but it suddenly turned into this feature film called The Goofy Movie, which eventually became A Goofy Movie. And... Um, I ended up sitting by myself in the corner of an empty suite at the at the Disney building uh, for almost a year, <laughs> typing away. And um, and then along came Kevin and his team, and boy, that film just took off. And for the for all of you out there, uh, a goofy movie, an extremely goofy movie, and Goof Troop are all available on Disney Plus. So if you need to do your homework to catch up. <laughs> You can do it today. All right. Next, we have writer and story supervisor behind a Goofy movie, Brian Pimentel. Hi. <laughs> All right, Brian. You had worked on story for other classic animated films like Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin before this. Was a Goofy movie a unique challenge because it featured established and beloved characters? I think I think the challenge with, with Goofy was that it he had only been in short, so... I know for Kevin and I getting into it, we had to kind of embellish that character a little bit more and look for ways to bring some depth to the character. And um, I remember Jeffrey Katzenberg pushing us a lot to get into um, more than we would expect Goofy to be and that he'd have some emotional depth. I think you guys succeeded at that very well. He's the voice of more classic characters that, than you can fit through a honey tree, including Darkwing Duck, Tigger, and Ray the Firefly. But he's also the Pete to beat, Jim Cummings. Hello, everyone. There he is. Oh. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> drumsticks as a precautionary measure. You never know when I get attacked of the funk. I love how in a Goofy movie and Goof Troop, Pete gets to tread such a fine line between relatable father and his classic villain self. How did you manage to pull that off? Well, I took the precaution of uh, reading the script that uh, that doggone Megan <laughs> wrote for us, and uh, I, I just thought it was great. You know, he he he, uh, he Jim knows what he's doing out there after all these years, right? But uh, you know, he crafted that, and it was the thing is, you have to be. With Pete, he's see, he's not really a classic villain villain in this sense in this movie. You know, he's just more like the bullyish neighbor. 
So he was more blowhard and uh, kind of uh, Yahoo than anything else. And I'm already there anyway. So I just uh, kind of channeled my inner, not so inner self. And you know, I, I had seeds like this. There you go, buddy. You got to keep under your thumb and stuff like that. So I just stayed in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. All right. On to the next in our lineup. He's been the voice of over 250 animated characters over the years, but today he's Pete's son, PJ, Rob Paulson. Hi, Justin, it's me. I just want to tell you that it is such a pleasure to be here in the happiest place on the web right now. But still, my dad's a knucklehead. Your question is, uh, how, how did you have fun creating a character that was meant to be the antithesis of Pete in, in a lot of ways. And uh, how did you develop that even further as he was older for a goofy movie? Well, it turns out that they were paying me good American dollars to do it. So I, I reckon I better figure it out. Um, but no, th honestly, uh, when you're surrounded by people like Billy and Jim and the truly incredible staff, people, Kevin, everybody who put this thing together. Um, it really makes my job a whole lot better. Also, we've been working on uh, Goof Troop, the series, for, I don't know, a year and a half, a couple of years already. Um, and so the character was pretty well uh, fleshed out or fleshed out in the context of working with the other actors. But truly, it's not false modesty. I'm good at my job. But when you're hanging out with that group of actors, Jason and Billy and Jimmy, it's just, it's really easy. So, uh, and, and the recording sessions themselves, before we got to the feature, were always just uh, laugh fests from which we'd have to go home and heal ourselves in the hot tub from breaking a rib laughing. Uh, it's a remarkable experience, and it just don't get no better, really. Next up is the voice behind Spoonerville High School's ASB president, Stacy Jenna Von Oy. Hey, everybody. It's Stacy here. I hope you guys are going to tune in later on Disney Plus for, you know, the Powerline concert. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. In a movie, in a fan favorite movie full of fan favorite characters, she has become one at the very top of that. Um, how did you find yourself in this, like, totally awesome role? I think it was just the um, my collection of hats that really that spoke to um, to the character. Do we just had that in common? Um, no, actually, I you know I I just was lucky enough to audition for it, and um, and I think uh, at the time I was on on Blossom, and my character Six was sort of an equally fast talking, hat wearing, uh, slightly less nerdy maybe uh, character, and so I feel like maybe I was sort of a shoe-in for it. Next up is editor Greg Perler, who's beaming in late night from Paris. There he oh, is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for staying awake for us, Greg. You're welcome. You're welcome. Happy, happy to join you all. So editors play a crucial but unsung role in films, especially animated ones. What challenges did you face editing this film? Um, I think that uh, the, the the biggest challenge was that I, I didn't know the Goof Troop. I, I knew who Goofy was, obviously, uh, from the short films, but I didn't know the television series. I didn't know Kevin Lima. Um, and so and this was my first um, sort of in the driver's seat job uh, as the editor, having come up through Disney feature animation. Um, you know, uh, we had an idea of, of how to make a story real and how to make it play well. And um, but it was just doing it for the first time under under the circumstances was kind of kind of nerve wracking. The other thing that happened that sort of that was a challenge was that we started the movie on film, meaning um, the, the movie was shot and edited on film you know, sprocketed film that you handle. And then about halfway through the movie, we switched to uh, a digital editing platform, which is the, the sort of standard today. But at the time, it was just sort of being introduced. 
And um, so I had to learn that and I had to have people brought in to help me uh, learn that and make that transition. Um, I, I think that we on Goofy Movie were the first movie at Disney to make that transition. We must have done something right because Kevin used you in several more of his films. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess I learned the Avid okay then. Yes, thanks, <laughs> Kevin. Um, so next up is the musical icon behind more Disney albums and soundtracks than you can count, including a Goofy movie, Bambi Moe. Thanks for the compliment. Um, I have to just get it out of the way because I'm asked this all the time. Yes, Bambi is my real name. And yes, I worked at Disney. <laughs> Especially oh, with, with, with Disney Plus. I, everything I ever worked on is now uh, finding a new audience. So it's really exciting. Well, Bambi, your, your question is, uh, music plays such a role in the storytelling of this movie. At what point were you brought in? Um, because it, it did such a good job moving the story along. The way that we approach a Disney film that has songs is that this usually music is something that's done at the end of a movie. It's the it's done in the post production process. But with the Disney animated feature with songs, songs come in right from the get go. We have to cast the songwriters, and we were lucky enough to get some of the best I think of all time, Tom Snow and Jack Feldman. They wrote all of our character-driven songs. I think one of the best opening numbers in any film is After Today. And then the other challenge was casting who to write the songs for um, the Powerline tracks, which were Eye to Eye and Stand Out. And a shout out to Pat Dereemer. He's kind of an unsung hero because people always ask me about Eye to Eye and Stand Out. Legendary music producer David Z. Rivkin is here, virtually eye-to-eye eye with us. Thanks for being here. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> You've worked with so many legends over the years, from Etta James to Billy Idol and Prince. Uh, how, how did you come to work with Powerline? Uh, well, I think um, when Bambi got a hold of me, it, uh, they, they wanted a contemporary uh, sound for Powerline, and I mean, I was working with Prince at the time, so uh, it followed that they wanted something to sound like that. Obviously, I don't think Prince would be doing it, so uh, they got me. And we were trying to uh, to do what, what I always did. And, and at the time, Bobby Brown and Prince, and those were the top of the charts. This, instead of bringing, right, having songs for a movie, I was doing the songs for the songs, and the movie was attracted to the songs. That was kind of my theory, is that we did the music for the music's sake, and they'd be able to accommodate that, which I think worked really well. And, um, yeah, it's funny. A lot of people, uh, I've done a lot of artists, a lot of records, and one of the most popular <laughs> things I've been approached is everyone says, did you do the Goofy movie? And it was, it's amazing how big and how far that is spread. And it's taken on like second and third lives, uh, which I'm really happy about. All right. So now we're going to shift over to Jack. He's the reason you can't get on the open road out of your head. Legendary songwriter, Jack Feldman. Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody. Hey, Jack. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. All right. So you've written all sorts of iconic songs over the years, including in Newsies and Oliver and Company. What was it like writing for Goofy and Max? Well, one of the reasons that I admire uh, the Powerline songs and so many pop songs is because you have to start from such a blank page. and and come up with a completed song. Whereas when you're writing for character and story, the page is not nearly as blank. You have the writers, um, the writer is already giving you the character, how they speak, what the situation is that you're going to be writing for. And um, when you have an actor that you know is going to be playing the role, that helps even more. And when you have a star like Goofy, um, you have decades 
of things to refer back to, and they're the kind of things that tell you, well, yes, you could do wordplay with this character. There's a very definite <laughs> two-dimensional character there that who really lives like a three-dimensional character. And the difference between his voice and Max's voice is so great that it was easier to write a duet for two characters that are so different that you can make any argument they have or any intimacy that they have um, feel like it's really them who are speak they who are speaking or singing. Thanks, Jack. All right. So last, but certainly not least, is Disney legend and the voice of Goofy himself, Bill Farmer. Gorge, howdy, guys. <laughs> this is the goofiest reunion ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. So, Bill, for many years, Goofy had taken on one-off roles, and he really began to develop as a character in Goof Troop. And Goofy movie being set in the future of that, he really even gets to go to some new emotional depth. How did you bring Goofy to that um, further than you ever had before? That was probably the hardest thing that I had to do during the movie. In uh, Goof Troop, we kind of set him in stone in that, that kind of version of Goofy. And as a Goofy movie developed from a Goof Troop movie, where I was just taking that character and moving it forward, now with a buddy-buddy picture and all these layers of emotion that he had never really had before, that was definitely the uh, hardest part of the movie, and I think the way we accomplished that was by countless retakes and uh, just doing it over and over and just trying to strike that balance between going too far with him and making him too silly and giving him some real heart, like maybe a sad clown kind of thing, and just hitting that that correct note that Kevin did so well in directing this it just, we, we finally did it, but it took a long time and a lot of different sessions to uh, really nail it. And, uh, but I think it really shows with the love that people have for this movie, you know, 25 years later. How long did it take you to record the film? Uh, off and on, I would say well over two years. I think we started roughly in the middle of 93 and it came out in 95. So over those two years, we probably had 30 to 40 different recording instances of going back and redoing scenes and scenes that didn't make it in the movie and other ones we would retool and maybe have a different attack on the character. And uh, yeah, it was a, uh, it was a, a, a long, long period of time. I enjoyed the residuals. <laughs> and the thing I love about those songs is, you know, there, there's that classic goofy sound and, and it really, you know, the, the classic Disney sound, but it's also balanced so nicely. It, it wasn't afraid to be contemporary and modern. And people love all of those songs equally. And, and how did you strike that balance? I think it was our goal from the very, very beginning to tell a contemporary story. You know, across the street, they were telling all these fairy tales and princess stories. And we said, how do we do something different than that? We have a chance to really dig in and tell something that speaks to today. Well, today in 1995. But uh, <laughs> that, was, that was really the goal, is how do we speak to kids how they live in their own world? And how do we, have, how do we give that a voice that sounds like who they are? And the great thing about that is it hasn't aged because you got that emotion so right, the, the father-son story, that modern audiences can connect just as well as they did before. How has that affected you all, and was that based on any real-life relationships that any of you had, even? Oh, it sure was for me. Um, my son, Austin, was born in 89, so he was about five years old when a movie, the movie came out. And, of course, he was, in my mind, he was Max. And uh, he was kind of, uh, I think the the movie affected him a little bit because uh, he didn't know if he was Max's brother or a uh, goofy son. It, it messed him up for years, but no, uh, he, 
Yeah, he was in uh, in my head a lot when I was uh, performing and trying to add the emotional part of Goofy, just thinking about my son. So, yeah, that uh, definitely was a buddy-buddy picture for me and my son as well as Goofy and Max. There you go. It's, it's personal for me in a big way, too, because my dad left when we were – when I was 12, and I didn't mm -hmm. see him again for 25 years. So in a way, this movie became sort of therapy for me. I could work out all my – all my issues and all my dreams and my wants of what a father would be and what that relationship would be through the movie. And it really taught me that if I bring a piece of myself, if I bring a piece of truth, piece, piece of my true self to any movie that I make, it will resonate in some way. And this movie has, has taken on a life of its own, I'll tell you. People from all around, you know, I'm, I'm surprised at some of the folks who come to me and say that this is by far their favorite movie that they've ever seen. And that's, uh, that's a remarkable thing when you get to be a part of that. And I think it's cool too, because the, the beauty of you telling that truth is that it really doesn't just resonate with boys and their dads. I mean, absolutely it does, but it's also, I mean, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old and they're both girls and they love the movie. <laughs> they saw it for the first time and first of all, had no idea that it was me. I'm not sure how, um, but, but they just, <laughs> But they absolutely, hands down, loved it and wanted to watch it again immediately thereafter. And I think there's something so beautiful about the fact that it really does span not only generations, but gender. There were no fads that could get old. It mm -hmm. wasn't a skateboard movie. It wasn't a movie about collecting pogs or a lunchbox. <laughs> right. it, it, was, it was kids and their dads and, and the eye roll. I mean, who, who among us has not gotten an eye roll hernia from things their parents have said? Yeah. Oh my God! I can't believe you. You know, poor, poor Jason and Max. That, that's all he did the whole movie. Dad. Yeah. You know, and if you can't relate to that, then oh, you know, kudos. Her good stuff. Were there any other characters or storylines that got cut or trimmed back that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Love this oh yeah. <laughs> Jim starts to laugh. We know where this is going. <laughs> well, no, I I worked pretty much alone for for months and months. And I was going back through some of my early drafts of the outlines and the treatments, and I was shocked to find out that we had uh, Goofy takes Max to a family reunion where we have nothing but Goofy people, you know, all in one place. Oh, wow. We had another <laughs> subplot where Max thinks he's going to Paco's water park. And just when they're about to get there, Goofy turns left and goes into the possum park instead. You know, so there were all these little things that we did, um, which were, you know, it was fun to write and whatnot. But I got to tell you, uh, when Kevin and his team got hold of this thing and started putting it together, it was like, oh, God, this makes so much sense now, you know. There were two other characters, Kevin, if you remember, that we uh, had really developed. It was like Joey Lawrence's character and Julie Brown's character. They were like the Chad, Chad, I think Chad was Joey. Yeah, Chad was his name, like, yeah. He was like a big threat to um, right. Max's relationship Max. with Roxanne. And, Julie and he's Brown, actually still remember. in the movie in yeah. After Today. You can see him in yeah. After Today. He's a blonde-headed guy who's flirting with this specific girl. And then at the end of After Today, he's actually making out with that same girl against a fence. <laughs> <laughs> right. Crazy what we got away with. Yeah. <laughs> I also remember, too, we brought in Judy Tenuta to play the receptionist. Do you remember Judy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it was amazing because she gave us a whole comedy performance, and unfortunately we didn't get to use her. As you mentioned to me, Kevin, a goofy movie was produced by Disney around the world. Disney Animation in Paris, Australia, and Burbank, along with studios in Phoenix, Toronto, and France. How big of a challenge was that to wrangle this production before you were able to video conference like this? <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true is that we were doing what we're doing right now before there was the Internet. So we did everything. We were on the phone. We were sharing facts. We were shipping things to each other. I actually made videotapes of myself, VHS tapes of myself, acting out every single solitary scene in the movie. So that the animators would get a sense of where I wanted them to take a scene because I couldn't be there in front of them. I couldn't act it out for them. 
And it's kind of shocking sometimes to watch because some there are some scenes where where Max especially pulls a face that I pull all the time. And it's kind of a little overwhelming to see it. I, I can't watch it sometimes. I have to turn away if I know it's coming because I can. it's like looking in a mirror. Strange. Oh, that's great. But you guys gave us a, a atmosphere. Yeah, I know Rob and I both tend to ad lib a lot, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not so good. But you you gave us that atmosphere and that uh, that Always. you know you know that that freedom, and it's a beautiful thing. And here we are talking about yes. it all these years later. Yeah, as Jim was Thank saying, uh, absolutely at uh, Comic Cons for the last ten years, oh. the popularity of the movie has just steadily increased. It's kind of like a fine wine. It just gets better with age and more people appreciate it. And now, 25 years later, parents and their kids both enjoy it together. And that's bringing a whole different dynamic where the fathers and sons can enjoy it together and moms and sisters and everybody. Everyone loves this movie. And absolutely, of anything I've ever done, this is number one on most people's minds when yep. they come up and there have been countless times where they say Goofy Movie has been my favorite movie, period. Not Disney movie, not animated, just favorite movie. It blows me yes, away. Please. And I'm so honored to be a, a part of it after all these many years. It's a great joy, and it's uh, fun to see it from time to time still. And thinking, yeah, it doesn't seem like 25 years either. Uh, it seems like it's gone by in a flash. But it also seems like it's always been there in a way. It's, yeah. uh, it's a great thing to be a part of. Well, thanks, everyone, for getting the band back together to celebrate a goofy movie one more time. We hope you'll all join us for our D23 Disney Plus watch party of a goofy movie. Follow along with hashtag D23 Goofy Movie and check out D23.com for more fun. <laughs> thanks, okay. everybody. Stay tuned. Bye. You know what to do. See you later. Bye. <laughs> thanks, all. Thank you so much for everything, guys. Thanks. Of course. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and we'll see you in the movies. <laughs>